when I was at Wright-Patterson, we had the flying saucers that went up. I think they covered the distance from Columbus to Detroit in something like uh, equivalent of about 20,000 miles an hour. I don't think anyone in the, con in the ordinary aerospace business would have had any knowledge of what they were even talking about if you mentioned quantum physics or, or wormholes or the type of things we know now because if you went to CERN and talked to the particle physicists, they would tell you certainly some of this was possible because they see it all the time. Where they think they see mass, they really see, uh, they really see energy frozen in a, in, a, in a time quantum. And what they're seeing is not, is, is, is just, is, is, a, is really a frozen bundle of energy. And it moves back and forth almost without any restriction. I thought, they, I thought there were enough credible stories that I may not be able to explain them, but they weren't phenomenon that were people's imagination. Whatever they saw was real, but I couldn't explain how it, how it was real, what made it real. But I think, what they, I think they saw what they saw. In Milstadt and the nearby, uh, near St. Louis, there was a fairly large triangular object scene, and it covered the distance down to South St. Louis. In some, in some of its sightings, it was moving relatively benignly, but then it, it literally jumped about 20 miles in a sec, couple of seconds. And uh, I've received a lot of phone calls from the local newspapers and TV stations as how can that be? And I said, I don't know how it can be, except if you explain it through something like a quantum physics explanation of, of time and space uh, relationships that gave you time and space travel. But other than that, I don't, there's no way I know that I can put a, the biggest rocket engine I could think of on it. It still couldn't get there at that speed. And the noise and the sound you would make doing something like that would wake everybody up for 10 miles. And it made no sound at all. Well, it, see, it starts out at hover, and it literally almost disappears and pops over here. So it's not like... It's not like a cartoon where it goes whoosh. It's almost like it disappears and comes up over here. Uh, at least the, the descriptions that some of the police officers gave to it. Uh, a lot of combat pilots routinely go up to seven and eight Gs, but that's a very specific direction. That's from your head downward along the axis of your spine. If you were to take that, what's called eyeballs in, which is when you accelerate the forces this way, uh, you literally uh, would have your eyeballs compressed out of their sockets and you'd have brain damage. So the, the Gs that do that might be in the level order of a thousand Gs. So no, that's not physically possible for any, even, even insects to take that level of acceleration, even over a short period of time. Uh, you might get, in an automobile accident, you might get 100 to 150 Gs, and that's when the car is completely crushed. So that's what happened, would happen to a human being if that were a conventional force accelerator. So it's not a conventional force accelerator, because if there's people in them, human beings in them, or some, a being in them that isn't crushed, then it has to be a different way of doing it. The hard part is, to find a way to physically do that. You know, there are people who have been experimenting with zero-point energy or try to tap zero-point energy for years. Every once in a while, someone will do it accidentally. They'll call it cold fusion, but I don't think it's cold fusion. I just think it's a zero-point energy tap. Except for three people that I know, uh, no one has been able to control it. When it happens, it happens for a short period of time, and it's almost always destructive. It's like drilling a hole in the, the base of Grand Coulee Dam, and all of a sudden this jet of water comes out that literally has enough pressure to cut you in half. Um, without a valve on it, you can't shut it off. Um, there's one guy that, I, that, that a friend of mine actually visited in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that was, I consider, a mathematical genius that actually figured out a way to control it. He was so paranoid 
he divorced his wife, left his wife and children, and went in hiding because he was terrified that someone would, would kill him for the knowledge that he had, the, the ability to, to tap this whenever he chose to and control it. We don't know where he, we haven't seen him in five years, I don't know where he is. You know, right now, today, you've got an energy problem with the price of oil. What do you think would happen if you introduced an ability to tap? Zero point energy represents about 40 to 50 megawatts of power per cubic inch of space. Um, that's a lot of power. That's f uh, 4,600 million watts of power. And if you could tap it at will, then no one would have to sell gasoline or oil anymore. You would just tap into it. It, 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 would, be, it would be like taking and going out to the Great Lakes and taking out one drop and using it. it would, you'd hardly miss it. <clears throat> and since it permeates the whole universe and it, it continually fluctuates as, it, as, as, the, as the, the matter and antimatter interact, uh, it's not like it's a steady lake. It's a, it's, a, it's a pool the size of the universe. So you'd never, for what we would use it for, you'd never even miss it. The only thing this one guy claimed that happened is if you bottle it and move it to another location and release it, he sounded exactly like Mr. Spock. He said you create a tear in the, in the time time domain of the of, of local space and actually cause a problem, which he claims he did and he will never do it again, which is bottle and move it. Now, now the other part is that you're not going it doesn't work on conventional jet engines. One has to create an actual zero point energy engine to do that. This one guy in Ann Arbor, Mich Michigan had one running in his basement, not connected to any power source whatsoever, sitting in the middle of a table and it, it had been running for a year. Of the ones I've seen, now they're, they're, there's, they're, they might be able to make a, an engine that would drive an automobile, or they might make a, a, a motor that would drive a pump for a well in Africa somewhere, or a generator to power a village. But none of them would have, the, have even this, the inkling of how you would build a, a, a ship the size of a football field and make it move at the speeds that that it, apparently it moved. And speed's actually the, the, the wrong word. What, what appeared to be changing in location at, in very rapid times. Because conventionally, we think of this as speeding through space, but what if it really acts like, a, like some of the high energy particles at CERN? They really transfer into energy and reappear over here, and there was no mass that went anywhere. Because all mass is, is solid energy. And if you find a way to move back and forth with that, the conventional wisdom is that a complex organic structure like us cannot transfer back and forth from energy to solid. But that's because we've, we've never seen it done. What you represent is uh, solid energy. Now, what you, you see, you think you're solid, right? In fact, the distance between the atoms in your body are almost exactly relatively proportional to the same distance as the planets around the sun. So, in fact, if you were to take, if you could, if you could look at your individual atoms, you would be 98% space. The, if, if we, if you, if, you, if you were the equivalent of a neutron star, which is only, only the, the, the nucleus and the electrons compressed, you're, you would fit on the point of a pin.